Welcome everyone to week four of our Policy 101 series with the Illinois Music Education Association. Um, I'm Lori Evenhouse, the Communications Manager with ILMEA. Um, one person I am joined by today is Lauren Rupert, our Policy and Advocacy Intern, who you've met before in previous episodes. And we are very happy to have a special guest with us today, um, Allison Maley from the Illinois Principals Association. Allison is the Government and Public Relations um, coordinator for, or I'm sorry, director for the Illinois Principals Association. And we are so glad that she is able to join us today um, from a related association in Illinois, all, also working with education and in that field, um, but with a different focus coming from the Principals Association. Allison, we're so glad you're here. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, so I already gave a little bit about your title, but maybe you could start off by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your role with IPA and what that looks like. Sure, sure. So uh, my role here at IPA is as our main lobbyist for the most part. Um, I spend most of my time January through May during the legislative session. Of course, they ended early this year, which I was not mad about uh, to get to the primary election time this, this time around. Um, but generally speaking, you know, working with legislators, working with colleagues in the school management field, um, but also with our colleagues at the teachers unions, advocacy groups, and the like on education policy. So, you know, of course, primarily I'm working with issues that affect building leaders. Um, it, it, my colleagues at the school board association work on things that are related to, to board members and employers. Um, and those types of issues are kind of segmented with those each, each of those different groups. But um, that's most where I spend most of my time January through May, and of course in the veto session. And the rest of the year, I spend time, you know, looking through the bills that had passed and became law, um, sharing that information with our members, um, encouraging them to contact their legislators. Um, in October, we, we do a Principal for a Day program. It coincides with National Principals Month in October. Um, so I have really taken it all in <laughs> as my own role to arrange visits with uh, legislators in schools within their districts. So we have our principals volunteer as hosts for principal for a day, uh, then reaching out to legislators to say that, you know, there's a school in their district that would love to have them come in, uh, you know, witness the day-to-day -day activities of a, of a building leader. Um, and hopefully they can, that can inform their, their decision-making as they go on in the legislature. Um, so I spent a lot of my, my fall working on that program. Um, but yeah, it's a lot, of, a lot of sharing information with our members, um, taking their feedback on legislation or, or other policy issues and trying to convey that to the legislature as well. Um, to be totally transparent, I am going to make a note of that principle for a day program and see how we might be able to translate that because so much of, of their perspective comes from seeing what's happening on the ground and seeing what's happening in, in real life school buildings. So Absolutely. if you don't mind, we might just make a note of that one. No, that's fine. In fact, um, I'm trying to kind of uh, craft something along the lines of what the Farm Bureau does. They have an adopt a legislator program where they have um, legislators from more urban areas, primarily Chicago, okay. um, come visit a rural area and visit a farm with one of their members. So I'm trying to kind of craft that in the same way with maybe a, an urban legislator visiting a rural school and vice versa. Um, but we're going to, I think, wait until after the general election is over to kind of get that rolling once once everybody's kind of in their place. And once there's some more so feel free to steal. that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, well, I'm actually going to turn over the next couple of questions to Lauren, um, since she is uh, much more versed than I am in the policy and advocacy, but I'm anxious to listen in on the conversation and learn as well. So Lauren, I'll let you take it from here. All right, thanks. Um, so let's just start off. What is a legislative or a policy success story of yours? Yeah, so um, I, you know, I was thinking about this question yesterday, and I would say more along the lines of little victories on, along the way, and, and just, you know, advocating for our members. A lot of times, you know, honestly, we're playing defense a lot of times when it comes to the legislative process. Um, you know, legislators have, have lots of great ideas about what should be done in schools, and, you know, it's our job to kind of go and, and explain that that is a great idea, but here are some of the unintended consequences, whether it's a funding issue or causing, you know, requiring that to cause, you know, to use up a lot of time during the school day, uh, those types of things. So I would say, you know, what we're aiming for is to take the piece of legislation and make it the most flexible for schools to implement. 
um, making it the easiest for them to implement without added costs, uh, either of money or time. Um, beyond that, I would say um, we were able to get principal mentoring funding restored in the state uh, last year and this year. Um, when I first came to IPA um, 11 years ago, uh, there was a little bit of money and then basically it was kind of zeroed out for the time being up until this last uh, school year. So, um, you know, I, I would go and, and pitch my case to the State Board of Education. They would include it in their budget request to the General Assembly um, and it just didn't get funded on their end. So um, I don't know if it's persistence or, or what, but we finally got that restored uh, the last couple of years. So we're really excited about that. That's amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> so I'm sure it must be very difficult um, to, you know, to bring all these people together and to try and get change, um, change pushed through. So what is it that you find to be the biggest challenge when you're advocating for these small policy changes? Yeah, I, I think, again, I think everybody has a good heart for education. Either they, you know, everyone's been to school themselves. Um, perhaps their, their parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles. Um, there are a few members of the legislature that have been teachers, school board members, principals, although not as many as there have been um, in the past since I, since I started at IPA. Um, so, you know, I think the challenge that we always run into is that um, people want schools to kind of fix everything that's, that's going on in our society. Um, and that's, that's a laudable goal, I think, you know, that's, that's a place where you've got, you know, basically a captive audience of, of young people um, to, you know, provide information that they will need to be productive citizens later on in their life. Um, but I think the challenge, of course, is always the resources to be able to do that. Um, you know, we're short on mental health professionals, we're short on counselors, nurses, um, we're short on teachers, for that matter, as you all know. Um, <laughs> And soon enough, we'll be short on administrators. I think that's already occurring in a lot of places. Um, just finding, you know, good people that want to do that job um, is difficult. And it's a difficult job. So I think that's probably one of the challenges is not only on the legislative end, just trying to um, work with legislators to understand the, the limitations that the school system has. And then with our members, you know, making it so that they they feel like they're supported and, and um you know, that it's a profession that, that they would want, or that, you know, aspiring folks would want to go into um, if they're looking to move up in the, in the teaching ranks or to become a teacher leader, administrator, superintendent, anything along those lines, that it's a, it's a somewhat attractive position to go into because it is challenging. And I think those, those that are in the profession and in our membership, they love what they do, but they acknowledge that it's a, it's a challenging place to be. And I think one thing that's overlapping between music educators and principals too, is like, there's, it's a laudable profession. People are very passionate about it, but it's a lot of demands on your time. And then on top of that, to ask people to participate in advocacy and policy, like for, for when, for people for whom time is already short, um, that, that can be a hard thing sometimes just for them to balance and for us to encourage them in that. Yeah, that's definitely true. And, and really when I try to um, ask our members to get involved, I, I am cognizant of their time restraints. And I really kind of don't ask them to do a, a whole lot unless it's really, really important. Not that every bill isn't important, but um, there are some that are more um, impactful on their day-to-day -day than others. And so I try to kind of limit what I'm asking them to do um, it has been nice to have Zoom as an opportunity for, for members to testify with committees. Um, so, you know, it's, it's difficult for, our, in fact, our president, our current president, um, until tomorrow, really, um, is in Huntley, Huntley High School, uh, Dr. Marcus Bielan. So that's a good three and a half hour drive to get to Springfield. And so not, a, not you know, in addition to being gone for the entire day from your school building, just the travel and everything else, um, it makes it difficult to get our members here to really express what you know a, a piece of legislation would mean for school administrators. So it's been nice to kind of have that opportunity to have them be able to, to zoom in and, and testify from their desk and from their from their office. So hopefully that will continue as we learn from things from the pandemic going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I I love how you said earlier that everyone has um, a good heart for education because I think that can be really, really tough, especially from the education side is it, it almost feels antagonistic when some of these bills are passed. But 
Um, I appreciate that you said that it is all done with good intent. So I suppose then kind of along those lines, is there like another important component to advocacy or policy change that you think is often overlooked? I would say relationships. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. I mean, if you're at the Capitol, it's it's the relationships that get you access to individuals, whether it's staff or members. Um, and then for for your members and my members too, it's it's those relationships that they can build with their local legislators. That when something comes up, that that's the person that they call. Um, it's great that they call me. That's that's wonderful, and I often reach out to them proactively, but. At the same time, they want to hear from their own constituents in their own districts about what this bill would do to their schools or, or for their schools, for that matter. Um, so I think building those relationships is key. Um, again, I know it's, it's difficult right now in the midst of an election season to know who's going to be that person who's going to represent your school or your, or your district or even your, your home address. Um, but, uh, you know, as those things kind of fall into place, that's what I always encourage my members to do. Um, at one point, we had a, a senior member of the House who, you know, had the cell phone number of our president, and he would he would call her from the floor uh, before he reached out to me or any other member of our, you know, uh, the par you know our, our partner organizations with the boards and the superintendents. Um, he would just, you know, call up Kim and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this bill? Um, she would sometimes then call me to find out what to say, but it, but it helped to have that relationship that, you know, either one of them could just pick up the phone and call one another and say, hey, like, listen, I'm hearing from my association that this is a really challenging bill and vice versa. You know, he could reach out to her to ask her opinion on it as a school leader. So just building those relationships is, I think, the most important thing. And not so much that it's overlooked. It's just, I think that is the key to being an effective advocate. Um, on that note, we're talking about relationships. What advice would you give to a teacher who is looking to get involved in policy advocacy? You know, I think, you know, reaching out to their respective association, whether it's, um, you know, the union that they belong to, or it's a, a specific, you know, organization like yours. Um, I know some people are really involved in, in Teach Plus and some other sort of kind of niche um, organizations. So those are really good ways to kind of get a feel for what is going on in the legislature and just how to get involved. Um, and oftentimes, like we do, um, you know, we have a, we have a uh, advocacy tool for it. Make, we make it really easy for people to just like plug in their, their district information or their, or rather their address information, their contact information, and it sends that message directly to their local legislators without have them having to go through and, you know, look it up and craft a message. Of course, I usually allow them to edit it, um, but I've kind of crafted a message that they can send on a particular topic. So, you know, I know a lot of associations and, and advocacy groups do that for their folks. Um, so that's, you know, an easier way to kind of maximize your time that you have to, to advocate. Um, I would say the other thing too, is just to kind of be mindful of the things that um, you find as a challenge, you know, as, a, as an educator. Um, what are the things that you find challenging, whether it's um, having the time to do certain things, um, you know, one thing I think I talked about last summer with the emerging leaders was uh, curricular mandates and high school graduation requirements and how that impacts, you know, if, if students have to take a certain number of classes or a certain number of years in a particular subject, does that crowd out their opportunities to take music and take art and, and other, you know, theater and other um, things that they might want to do, career and tech ed for that matter. Um, so just kind of thinking about those things that make it either more, more difficult for you to do your job um, or just more challenging as a whole. And those are the types of things that I'm asking our members to think about too when it comes to what we are going to determine for our policy initiatives going forward. Um, so just kind of, you know, maybe encouraging folks to think about those things in their day-to-day -day life about what, what would make this easier for me? What would it make this easier for my students um, to be successful? So that'd be something I would, I would share. So you've given us a lot of um, great things to think about, about how we as ILMEA can help support um, our educators and members from an advocacy and policy point of view. Um, so thinking about everything that we've talked about uh, this morning and today, can you give us in summary three tips for um, being effective advocates and for effective advocacy for music educators? 
Yeah, you know, I think the first one again is to get to know your legislators and have them get to know you. Um, hopefully they will, you know, learn to uh, or, or become comfortable with reaching out to you as, as an expert in the field and an expert in education. Even if it's music education and it's a niche topic, that's what they need to know. They need to have a person that they can call on um, when it comes to things like, you know, if they're, if they're considering curricular mandates, well, how's that going to affect music education? Um, maybe that's, that's the way to kind of get the foot in the door to be the person that, that, that they call upon. Um, I'd say the other thing is to, you know, speak from experience. And then, you know, the third is to be confident in that experience. So, um, you know, knowing that you, you do have experience in the classroom, experience as, as a leader in your school, um, and kind of drawing upon that experience when it comes to speaking with legislators and others and policymakers, whether it's, you know, state board folks or, or legislators for that matter, um, you know, you do, you do have experience. You're the one that's in the classroom. And so, you know, when people say, well, schools should do this, or why aren't they doing that? You know, you're the person that can speak to the why or why nots, um, or the challenges that that idea may pose when it comes to the classroom. Um, so yeah, I would say just, you know, speak from experience and then be confident in that experience that you have. And those are all really, um, I don't want to say simple things, but all fairly straightforward things that anybody can can start to use and think about and implement. So thank you for that. Um, sure. Lauren, any other questions? Anything else for Allison? No, just thank you so much for joining us here today. It sounds like you're doing a lot of great work and um, have a lot of broad tools that even though it's specific, your work is specific to principles that can be applied to all other areas of education. So thank you. Of course, thank you for having me. And um, to everybody listening and watching, thank you so much for um, joining us in this conversation. As always, if you have questions about advocacy as a policy and how that intersects with music education, I encourage you to reach out to Lauren. Um, her email address, which we'll put in the show notes as well, is advocacy at ilmea.org. Um, and we'll see you back here again next week. Allison, thank you so much. Okay.